And joining us now on the debate in Charlottetown, Prince Edward Island, Karen Burchard, Canadian correspondent for the Chronicle of Higher Education. In New York, New York, Julie Desjardins, author of The Madame Curie Complex, The Hidden History of Women in Science. And with us in studio, Imogen Co, Chair of the Department of Biology at York University, currently on sabbatical. Sandy Graham, Lecturer in Computer Science at the University of Waterloo. And Diane Freeman, President of Professional Engineers Ontario. And it's great to welcome you all both here in the studio and in points beyond to our program. I want to start by putting up two graphics, uh, the substance of which I'm sure all five of you know all too well, but I'm going to share this with our audience and then we'll come back and chat. Michael, if you would, first one here. University degrees by gender. And we can see these are 2008 numbers that when it comes to bachelor degrees, 60% of the students are women. When it comes to master's degree, there's still a majority who are female. But then once you get up to the doctorate degree, those numbers flip around and almost 56% of those are men seeking doctorate degrees. One more chart. Of all of those women who are seeking post-secondary education, university enrollment, Almost 20% are going into social science and the law, 17% into the humanities, 15.5% go into business, 9% go into the study of education, and then look what happens once you get into the sciences. Not even 8% in physics and life sciences, 3% in architecture, and 1.4% of women who are in university in 2008-2009 study math and computer sciences. Okay, let's try and find out why. The so-called STEM careers, science, technology, engineering, math, women are clearly not choosing these fields. Julie, start us off, why not? <laughs> wow, where to begin, right? Um, well, you know what I like to, we like to think it's a numbers problem and that we're just not getting lots of numbers of women into science, but I, I think it's a cultural problem. I think it's a problem with the culture of science the culture has been masculine really for as long as we've had professional science. I mean, part of the whole process of professionalizing science meant infusing masculinity into it. So this is a very, very deeply seated historical problem. Diane, how would you follow up? I really think that she's on the right path here. It's just that even young children are getting those images right from elementary school that the careers associated with mathematics and science tend to be male dominated. And in addition to that, young women are more willing to identify that they are not naturally skilled in mathematics and sciences and young men to say they are skilled in that. When in essence, they probably have equal skills. It's just young men seem to be more able to say, this is what I do best. And young women have a tendency to say, this is what I work hardest at and I don't necessarily feel confident doing it. Karen, throw another, uh, another issue into the mix, if you would. Well, I think that it's a very complex issue uh, to start with. And if you, you have to delve beneath the, the statistics. And they're not always what they appear to be. And I also think that um, it's an issue that men may have to become more involved with. Uh, there was a conference last year that was quite interesting. Uh, they were blue skying. How can we get more women interested in studying science and becoming scientists? And uh, one group of male professors said, you know, why don't we try tying our grant money to the number of women we have in our classes or that we might have in our labs? Mm -hmm. which is an interesting way to look at it. Okay, maybe we'll, we'll discuss that a little more as we go along. Sandy, t talk to me about this. Nobody sits around wringing their hands saying, how do we get more women into the National Hockey League? <laughs> but they do sit around and they say, how do we get more young girls to like maths and sciences and engineering and so on and so forth? So tell us this, why is it important to have more women in those fields? Well, um, there's a few, few reasons for it. And I, I think there are a lot of people that don't ask that question at all. I think a lot of people say if they don't want to do math or computer science, I, I'm in computer science in particular, why are we forcing them into an area that they're just not interested in? For one thing, some of the top jobs, uh, Wall Street Journal, for example, if you look at their top jobs, a lot of them are math-based, engineering-based, computer science-based jobs. And these women are selecting themselves out of some really great opportunities for themselves. 
in North America, we're going to have a shortage in computer science uh, IT professionals in the future. We can't eliminate half of the potential workforce from that in our, for our own economic future. But the most important thing for me is that diversity is important. And especially in an area like engineering or computer science where we are designing things, if we don't have a perspective from a variety of sources, that's going to lead to a lack of, uh, of good solutions. Imogen, you want to follow up on that? Why would it be important to have women better represented in these fields? I, I echo exactly what Sandy is saying. I think it's uh, really important to have that diversity and to um, enable uh, all members of our, our, our society to see themselves reflected in these uh, professions and see the, the potential that's out there for them. Um, I think uh, we need to maximize our human potential. And I, I resist the um, notion that it's a women's issue. I think it's a human rights issue, and I think it affects all of humanity. I think we need to make science a more humane profession, both for our young men and for our young women. And I think when we become more inclusive, then I think we're going to only raise the, the, the standards and raise the profile and, and uh, improve the diversity. Julie, the expression I've read about or I've heard is, women are more interested in people, men are more interested in things. And that's why, right. you know, you don't see as many women dealing with things. You see them in professions that have more to do with people. Does that make sense to you? Absolutely. Well, I have, to, I have a seven-year-old daughter who is one of these girls that's much more interested in things, I have to say, and I get the kindergarten teacher calling me, telling me that there's something wrong. <laughs> and I asked her, I said, you know, what about the boys in the class? And of course, boys in the class, that's totally acceptable. Um, I'm not saying that women inherently or girls are inherently this way, but God knows they're encouraged to be this way. Girls are so want, supposed to want to be much more social. Boys, it's not a big deal if they're much more isolated and like to tinker with things and be on their own. And in fact, many people suggest that this is the makings of a good scientist. So unfortunately, even if girls do have these proclivities, they're not encouraged to continue along with those proclivities. Sandy? I would agree with what, what you say, but I think the other aspect of this is that we don't want to change girls. I, that's not really our goal here. We don't want to make girls be more like boys. We want to have that perspective, their perspective, come in and into these, these areas because it broadens the field. Diane. Absolutely. The interesting thing is you said that it's, girls are more interested in people, but engineering really can be about people. Now, I know and you engineers say that, but come on, <laughs> engineering is more about things than people, isn't well, it? Well, not what I do. I mean, I'm worried about air quality. I'm worried about when you walk down the street, whether or not you can do so and breathe the air safely. And that's really about people. It's just we, it's how we communicate it. It's how we reach out and communicate. And I'm not talking about just communicating to young women, but men too. And Tizir Abunazar, who you've had on this show several times, who's the dean at UBC, has said on many of an occasion, if we can better communicate that engineering is about people, is about serving the public, then we might actually even attract more and better engineers into the profession and more women. Karen, is that really uh, an accurate, you know, I, I summarized it by saying boys are interested in things, girls are interested in people. Does that sum up a lot of what we're talking about tonight? Yeah, and more or less, but we also have um, maybe the flip side of that. It's the where you have women in areas that where more so than men. For example, the last 10 years has seen a, a, a really tremendous flip in veterinary medicine, for example, where now most of the veterinary medicine colleges in North America have between 80 to 85 percent women and only 15 uh, to 20 percent men. And that's a, that's a real flip. And they're very worried about this. And it's mainly because they would like to have a gender balance hmm. and the diversity there. You can't have too many of one sex uh, in, in, a, in a profession. And they don't, uh, there's, this, is a, this is a big topic of discussion right now within uh, the vet colleges. Like, wh what can we do to attract more, uh, more balanced hmm. um, popul school population? You Understood. Know? Diane, let me bring you in on this. And this, I mean, we can't do a program about this without talking about one of the most horrendous things that happened in the history of our country. And you know I'm talking about 1989. Mark Lapine uh, went in with a with a gun into Concordia and murdered 14 female engineering students. After that, to the late 1990s, 
female enrollment in engineering schools went from 12 percent, I'm told, to 22 percent. There was a real sense that we're not going to let this, mm -hmm. you know, fill in the blank, uh, you know, have a, have a posthumous victory in some respects. Was there a correlation there, in your view? I don't know about that. I think that it brought attention to engineering, certainly, and it brought attention to the fact that women, women are in engineering. They are in the profession. They are doing things. Um, that was a particularly tr um, big turning point for me because I was the same age as those young women. And I, and I was in university at the time and working on a construction site with 65 men and one woman. And uh, it was a particularly trying time and it continues to be something that I spend a lot of time remembering. I, I don't know what it was that triggered young women to actually look at, look at engineering as a profession. But what concerns me is why did they stop looking? Well, that's what's interesting, because Karen, uh, Karen, I'll bring you in here. At 2003, it starts to decline down to 17%, and then we saw where the numbers are right now. Um, you know, architecture and engineering down around 3% now. What happened exactly? What do you think? I don't know. Um, it's, it's a puzzlement. I mean, it's, it's, as I said, it's complex. Um, I think that a lot of girls decided that maybe engineering wasn't the right track that they, they wanted to go into. Uh, there was, we, we did have mentoring, we've had uh, role models. There's a movement to, you know, to have more women engineers. But there was also, um, I, don't, I don't know what to, what to call it. Uh, there were other careers that were suddenly opening up too. And I guess women just, you know, the women just decided, no, I don't really want to, want to uh, become an engineer. And I don't know how you break that. I don't know how you get through that. Because even within the engineering field itself, most of the women who are engineers or engineering students. I mean, 40% of them are doing what? Environmental engineering and computer engineering is very, very low. Um, I believe it's like 9% uh, or something mm -hmm. at a time when there are jobs galore just waiting for somebody to take, uh, uh, graduate with, uh, with a degree in, in uh, computer engineering. Sandy, you got a theory on that? Well, uh, the problem is that it's a choice. The women aren't, um, barred from the doors. They're not saying you can't come in here mm -hmm. and, and take these courses. They are choosing not to take these courses, which is a much harder problem because if it was a st systemic problem where we could come in and deal with the, the, uh, the places that are offering these programs and deal with them from the top down, then we might be able to solve it. But when we're trying to change the perceptions of the millions of girls out there that are making choices and have all the choices in the world in front of them, it's harder. It's a harder problem, and it's it all comes back to me to image. It's uh, in computer science, in particular, engineering to some extent. Although areas like uh, com uh, environmental engineering do fairly well with the number of women in it, but computer engineering, electrical engineering do very poorly. To try and change the image, I, I said the best thing that could ever happen to the field is if we had some hit TV show mm -hmm. out there <laughs> that really made computer science and engineering exciting. But the problem is what we have out there right now is the Big Bang Theory, which is a very funny show I watch myself. <laughs> but if I was trying to recruit women to physics right now, it would be the worst thing that could have ever happened. Diane? One of the things I wonder is whether women were already tracking towards engineering careers and then a cool polytechnique happened mm -hmm. and then they decided to stop tracking for it. So they, they, they were already looking on the mathematics and sciences and they were making their way. And so they said, well, I'm this far, I'm going to stick with it. and then. Things have happened. Math curriculums have changed. When we went from a five-year diploma in high school down to four, there was a big shift in the number of students that felt prepared to go into the sciences because they didn't have that fifth year of mathematics. I have a son who is, who is a, a 90 plus student in mathematics and science who is saying, I still want to do an extra year in high school because I don't feel as though I have even enough math to go directly into engineering. So there's, there's something happening in terms of that that before university stage as well. Julie, you wanted to add? I, it, it's just making me laugh inside because I, this is such a historical problem. I mean, you know, back in the day when Madame Curie came to the United States, 
everyone thought that this was going to be this great moment when all of these American women went into science. And I have to tell you, they actually polled hundreds of high school women after she left in the 1920s, something like 330 women, and only three of them actually wanted to follow her track. And that said, many of them found her very inspiring. And this is where I think, um, you know, the, the book that I've written, The Madame Curie Complex, this is the Curie Complex. In some ways, she was so head and shoulders above, or at least was perceived that way in the public, that a lot of women just thought they were ill-equipped. It's much like, you know, your son when you were saying that he still feels like he doesn't have enough math. So many women feel like they have to be head and shoulders above everybody else to even compete in science. You know, who can live up to Madame Curie? Well, that does suggest, Imogen, that there's a bit of women are their own worst enemies when it comes to this. Is some of that going on here? Oh, that's a, that's a dangerous um, sentiment. Um, I think that there is a serious lack of self-confidence. And I think uh, I, I'm in the life sciences, so it's a little different for us um, in that we see um, a greater proportion of, of women at the undergraduate and at the graduate levels, and then we see them drop off at higher levels. So we have a, a, a very significant leaky pipeline kind of issue. But I do uh, recognize and see frequently the, the um, gnawing kind of lack of self-confidence um, in their own abilities amongst young women in, in the sciences. And I think that extends um, uh, through levels of um, the junior professoriate and uh, researchers. Um, women tend to internalize problems and they tend to take it on themselves that it's their own fault when things don't work out, whereas men seem to um, blame the external environment much more effectively. And, uh, women are not very good at shameless self-promotion, whereas uh, <laughs> men seem to be um, uh, raised yeah. from an early age to yeah. be very, very good at shameless self-promotion. And those are the kinds of attributes and characteristics that will serve you very well in professional science. So I think it's a combination of cultural training and background um, and, and prevailing environment that leads to the, this sort of sense of I'm not good enough, I'm not adequate enough, and, and imposter theory. Um, and, uh, and self-confidence. I don't think women are to blame for that. I think that's a consequence of, of the prevailing environment. Gotcha. Karen, you wanted to say? Yeah, I do. I do want to uh, make a point that many of the women in the sciences and engineering were pioneers, shall we say, trailblazers. They were the first. Um, set, set the way for the others to follow. And um, I did that my own career in uh, broadcasting and journalism. But we had to be better than our male counterparts in many cases. And that still seems to be the case in, uh, if, you can re if, if you can believe some of the recent surveys. There was a survey done in the States last year that looked at postdocs. And it turns out that in many labs, the female postdocs, on average, were doing 20 more papers than their male postdocs in the same lab. Karen, you know, your comment reminded me, I think it's Maureen Reagan, the president's daughter, who, who once said, you know, to get ahead in this world, you've got to be twice as good as men, and, and thankfully that's not that hard to do. <laughs> But um, if, if I can just interject, go ahead. If I can just interject. Uh, the the Nobel Prize winner Rosalind Yalo, when she won the Nobel Prize in 1977, that that saying with a plaque she used to have on her door, and she very <laughs> much believed it. Well, Julie, while you've got the feel uh, the floor here, rather, t tell me about this. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they say that if you really want to get somebody, if you want to have somebody in such and such a career, you got to get them while they're young. And I gather that you, you know, you fell in love with what you're doing now when you were a young girl. How did it happen? Wow. Well, you know, I have to tell you, I was actually, I was excellent at biology and I was excellent at history. And I, I hate to say it, I was one of those casualties. I'm one of those statistics where I started to have that internal dialogue about just being ill-equipped at math. I was very good at math for a time, um, but I was getting all of the messages. And it's only now that I've written about women in science that I go back and I try to replay what was going on with me. But uh, for sure, I, I think about it. And I certainly didn't get a lot of... Uh, enthusiastic response from my chemistry teacher in high school. It didn't help that, frankly, I was 
dating boys in my math classes and not in my history classes, you know. And so now I, I write about dead people for a living. It's not a coincidence. <laughs> but you wanted to be a scientist and it didn't happen because, what, an education system kind of uh, steered you away from it and things like that? Well, all of this is very subtle, you know, and it certainly wasn't a conversation I was conscious of at the time. I actually think I had told myself I was simply not good enough at math. Hmm. Um, I felt like I had topped out. I mean, I was very good at biology, but I kept on thinking to myself, I'm not good enough at math to make this a career. Diane, one follow-up on this, and then I'm going to bring Larry Summers into this mix. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. There's some really interesting statistics out there where they look at young children and ask them to draw what they believe is an engineer or scientist. Mm -hmm. and, and that in those studies, they show that children are gender neutral until about grade mm -hmm. one. And then they will draw a scientist in a lab coat with glasses, and it'll distinctly be a man. And that's happening yep. at age six. Right. And, and so I work with some folks on, on early years curriculum, and it was very interesting. I have early year educators in a daycare center that I helped found in Waterloo, and one of those educators said to me, I love this stuff. I never knew I loved this stuff. And I looked back in my, high, in my school grades to find out when it was that I stopped liking math, and it was in grade two that my math teacher wrote on my report card, Karen doesn't seem especially strong in mathematics. <laughs> Grade two. Who can say that a child in grade two is not strong in math? Well, let's look for another possible explanation here, and I need not remind the people around this metaphorical and actual table of something that the former president of Harvard University speculated about a number of years ago, and here's how it was written up about in Slate magazine. He offered, Larry Summers did, three possible reasons for this gender gap, what we're talking about tonight. The biggest he suggested was that fewer mothers than fathers are willing to spend 80 hours a week away from their kids. The next reason was that more boys than girls tend to score very high or very low on high school math tests, producing a similar average but a higher proportion of scores in the top percentiles, which lead to high-powered academic careers in science and engineering. The third factor was discrimination by universities. Summers said repeatedly that Harvard and other schools should work to eliminate discrimination, but he theorized that it was less a decisive factor than the others since women were already underrepresented by the time they got to the pool of candidates eligible for top science jobs. Now that's part of what he said. We've kind of buried the lead here because the fact is he also said it may also be the case that men are just, and here's that word, Sandy, innately better at this stuff than women. Mm -hmm. What did you think when you heard that? Well, it, it's, it's very frustrating because, as I say, it all comes back to diversity is a good thing. And whether the strengths of any of the candidates coming in are, you know, whether they're male or female, whatever their strengths are, you can bring different strengths to the okay, table. but is he right? Are men innately better at this stuff than women? And that's why the numbers are so well, disproportionate. Well, the way we measure it, the way we measure it, they are. There's no question about that, the, using the measurements that we are, that have become standard. For example, the University of Waterloo uh, hosted the IOI this past August, which IOI? is a, it's the International Olympiad in Informatics. It's a high school competition. We had over 300 competitors from all over the world there, and there were maybe less than 10 women at that. So at the, at the top competition level for high school computer science, there's a very few number of women who are competing there. So if you use that as the measurement, then that's saying that men are better than, this, uh, than, than women. But that doesn't mean that they are innately better at the profession, at the potential ideas that could come out if they join the profession. Um, CMU has uh, had some great success in attracting more women into their computer science program. They changed their admissions requirements to make it more female friendly. There was no question that the male applicants were were um, being judged better, but they found once they brought these women in, they were equally successful in the program. What's CMU? Uh, sorry, Carnegie Mellon University Carnegie Mellon. In, okay. in the United States. Uh, okay, Diane, and then I want to hear Julie on this as well. Are, are men innately better, not as Summers said, but as he posited, speculated? I'm not willing to say they're innately better. I think it's just that we are not helping young women to explore mathematics and science innately from an early age. I think we parcel them off, we buy Lego for the boys, and we buy Barbies for the girls, and if we gave everyone Lego, <laughs> maybe more their engineers. innate skills would be more um, Okay, but, but built. okay, the legitimate follow-up here is, don't we buy Barbies for the girls because that's what they want. When they go into a store and they see a choice between Lego and Barbie, they want the Barbie, and the boys want the trucks. But we need to ask why. 
Like why? Like where? Where's the dividing point where where some where a young lady doesn't feel that Lego is a good toy for them? That's okay. that's the question. Julie, and then uh, and then uh, let's say Julie, and then uh, Imogen after that. That is the sixty-four thousand dollar question, isn't it? I mean, I it, it's so deeply seated. I have. To, I mean, as a as a cultural historian, I don't care for any sort of biological rationales from the get-go. Though I have since been educated about this, and I know there's plenty of good research out there where they do at least consider these biological rationales. But when I had heard, you know, Larry Summers posit this, I have to say the reason why I was so shocked, I don't know what your reaction to it, but all my friends in sort of gender circles, we were surprised at the charged reaction to Larry Summers because for us this was already a closed issue. We, you know, immediately were dismissive of the biological rationale. Um, and I think the fact that the answer, or at least the reaction was so charged, I think that this just goes to show that out in the public it's very much an open-ended debate. And he had really struck this nerve. Um, and this is why I wrote, you know, my book, was because I wanted to know what nerve it was he struck, and I'm more convinced than ever that the nerve he struck was really saying that this problem with women in science is not a numbers problem. It really is a cultural problem. You know, we still think this notion of scienticity, and by this I mean the ability to be and think and act scientific is masculine to the core. And I think so long as this is the case, women will necessarily be second-class citizens in institutional science. Imogen. Um, yeah, there's a couple of points, and actually I wouldn't mind getting uh, Julie's uh, uh, um, co confirmation or accuracy reading on one thing. Mm. It is a cultural, I believe it's a cultural issue. I don't believe there's innately a difference. Um, I think the normal distribution for ability in, in girls and boys is so broad that, and so overlapping that, that you know, there's no innate difference. Um, I believe it's cultural, and I'm surprised that Larry Summers came up with this, and I agree that it was surprising that it had such a charged response. Um, I'm surprised that he didn't refer to experiences in other parts of the world, because if you look at Eastern Europe, um, traditionally uh, uh, there have been a way higher proportion of female engineers, um, uh, mathematicians, and similarly. So I believe that's true, Julie. Uh, um, and so there is clearly, yeah. you know, we, people, yeah. we, have a, we have a laboratory out there that we can do the experiment. And culturally, uh, there was no innate difference there. Many more women went into engineering. And as those Eastern European countries became more westernized, you saw the numbers fall of women going into science and engineering. So mm -hmm. that, you can sort of draw you your go. own conclusion from those data. Mm -hmm. the, other, the other second point was that, um, is there an innate difference? And you ask the question about buying Lego for the boys and Barbies for the girls. Why do we go buy Barbies for the girls? Because that's what they want. What, what's, what about the question of why aren't we buying Barbies for the boys? Because sometimes that's <laughs> what they want. Um, when my daughter was about four, she went to a birthday party where there, was, there were toys to take home at the end of the, end of the uh, day. And there was a little puzzle. And then there was a, a makeup kit for four-year-olds. And she wanted the puzzle. And the host, very lovely people, uh, said, oh, you sure you want that? That's the boy toy. Mm. Yeah. Um, I'm sure I have a son as well. I'm sure my son would have been equally um, thrilled to get the makeup kit. <laughs> um, <laughs> that why do we make this a, a women's issue or a girl's issue when we're actually culturally training our children in their genders, both of them, from a very early age? And I think if we try to make more of an effort to remove some of those sort of very stereotypical uh, pathways we put them on, then it'll be better for everybody. We can't just focus on how we raise our girls. We have to focus also on how we raise our boys. Well said. Karen, we haven't heard you yet. Here? Yep, go ahead, Karen. Um, first of all, Larry Summers lost his job. I just want to get that. <laughs> yes, he did. He did. Out there. Um, secondly, let's talk about Barbie for a second. Uh, back in 1992, Mattel I uh, came out with Talking Barbie. Do any of you remember Talking Barbie? Yeah. And <laughs> Barbie said, oh, math class is tough. <laughs> and <laughs> that I caused a <laughs> huge backlash. And they had to pull Talking Barbie off the, the market. So last year, Mattel came out with computer engineer Barbie with her hot pink laptop and her pink glasses and uh, Bluetooth. And uh, she wears a t-shirt with uh, neon binary code up and down it. <laughs> you know. uh, so 
th apparently, they, they claim they designed it with the help of uh, the, um, one of the American uh, engineer women in engineering groups and also the American women in science. Hmm. Well, let's find so, out. Sandy, is that how you normally dress for work? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, this is how I normally dress for work. Um, yeah. okay. I, I'm very conflicted about computer engineer Barbie. I, I, they had a vote to see what the next Barbie would be, and I did vote for computer engineering Barbie without knowing what she would look like. Um, I agree, it's, it's kind of scary. It's, it's, you know, the ones and zeros on the t-shirt or with the Bluetooth and, and the glasses. I mean, it's all very stereotypical, which is I'm, I'm not about enforcing the stereotypes because I think that's a huge problem in attracting women. But at the same time, at least there's a computer engineering Barbie. So, so it's it's a hard thing for me to reconcile with myself. Is Sandy, computer engineering Barbie a good thing or a bad thing? Speaking of stereotypes, Sandy, how often do you get emails from people who don't know you and assume that Sandy Graham is male? It, it happens occasionally. It's it's mm -hmm. uh, you know because especially because I'm a, a teacher at a university, and so students and uh, and then people just generally often mistake me for male. Hmm. Uh, Karen, in the wake of the summer's comments, universities did start to hire more female faculty and they promoted women to head engineering schools, that kind of thing. Did you mm -hmm. find that to be a, a, was that real or was that tokenism in your view? No, I don't think it's tokenism. I think uh, they, they were picking the best candidates in many cases. Uh, but if you look at where the women are, they're all, you know, they, if you can imagine a pyramid with, uh, you know, the president at the top and the full professors, then the assistant professors and the lecturers, and then the, uh, just the, the teaching assistants or whatever you want to call them, and then the sessionals, or I guess that would be reversed. Um, you have the bulk of the women are in the lower categories, and they're gradually going to have to work their way up. Uh, but it's a start. Right. I do want to bring up another point, if I could. Um, I came across a statistic the other day from the UK, and they have 350,000 women who have degree qualifications in the STEM subjects who are not working in their fields. Hmm. You know and, what? Let's, mm -hmm. for, forgive me, I'm going to jump in, Karen, because we've got five minutes to go, and I want to, I want to put one more thing on the table here, and that is, you're certainly well aware of these numbers, uh, and I'm sure. You know what? I'm, Diane, I'm going to get you to comment on this first. Michael, let's bring up board two if we can. Canada Research Chairs, 25% awarded to women. In the scientific fields, 18.3% of those Canada Research Chairs last year awarded to women. Uh, the federal government appointed 19 new Canada Excellence Research Chairs, and guess how many of the 19 went to women? Zero. This must have got some conversation in your circles, Diane, when that news came out. What well, did people say? Yeah, it's a heartbreak, actually. And, and you do want the, the research monies to go to the best research projects. So you, you have to assume that they've based their decisions on what was put forth from the researchers. But it's a challenge. And it makes you ask the question, was how many women did apply? Because yeah, you, you, you do no need to, to know. You do need to know the, the back to the statistics. Mm -hmm. And one thing that I wanted to say was we've talked a lot about academia as opposed to what's happening in the workplace. And within the workplace, it's interesting. I think that they're, they're seeking diversity, too, from a very small pool, right? And, and one of the events I went to was with Engineers Without Borders. And they had over 1,000 attendees at their conference, all engineering, science, technology. 58% were women in that room. Where are they getting them all from? They are, there's, there is absolutely a cultural piece associated with serving the broader public that attract women. And engineers without borders have found some kind of key to unlock that interest. Is it possible, Imogen, I'm, I'm sure there was some discussion in, in your circles about this, that, that there simply were no qualified women to give those Canada research chairs to? 
I think there may have been that discussion, but I think it was pretty quickly dismissed because there clearly are very highly qualified women out there. But I think we have to look at the mechanism of how those uh, chairs were uh, solicited and how they were awarded. And we need to realize that there still exists something of an old boys club and there still uh, exists an element of networking um, and connections and promotion of your fellow uh, gang members um, in in uh, in some of these kinds did you, of events. Did you mean to say gang members? Oh, yeah. uh, maybe a little fellow bit. tribe, maybe, yeah. we'll say. Julie, <laughs> Julie, talk to us. I mean, it's 100 years since Marie Curie won the Nobel. How, how well does the Nobel Committee recognize the work of women in its deliberations? Well, you know, if you looked at 2009, oh. the numbers look great. There were three women in 2009. That said, that's three women out of a total of 16 ever since 1900 and I'm counting Madame Curie twice because of course she won two mm -hmm. one in 1903 and then another one in 1911 this is this happens to be the hundredth anniversary of her second Nobel Prize by the way um, so since then what's really interesting if you look at the women who have won science Nobels well if you look at people who have won Nobels anyway of course there's a disproportionate amount of women who have won them of course the Peace Prize and the Literature Prize but then once you get into the sciences it's not a coincidence you have 10 women that are in the biological sciences. You have, I think, four women that have won them in chemistry. And you have two women who have won them in physics. And of course, historically speaking, physics has been the most sort of high prestige and deemed the hardest of the sciences. As they get softer and squishier, then women tend to have a little bit more traction in them. Hmm. Diane, Can I jump you got, no, forgive me. I'm down to my last minute here, and I want to ask uh, Diane this question. You got kids? I do, two boys. You got two boys. How old are they? 15 and 12. So you are, you are already in a field, engineering, which is massively dominated by men, and then you took time out of your career to have kids. I sure did. How did that all work out? It was a challenge. It set me back. No matter, what, no matter which way you swing the cat, I was not physically in my office for 12 months. At that time, it was a six-month maternity leave. And so it's very hard to argue and say that, that the, the colleague that started working for the firm at exactly the same time as I did has as many years in. They have more. But you know what? Engineering firms are coming a long ways. My engineering firm is a consulting firm, Conestoga Rovers and Associates, and they recognize the, the importance that they've put in, in their employees, and in particular women, and if they want to take time off work or they want to come back and work part-time, we are project-based work. It's more important to them to keep that technical expertise within the firm and support someone through those transition years so that they have them when they want to come back to a full-time career. And that is the last word on this program. Thank you all very much for participating tonight. Out of town in Charlottetown, PEI, Karen Burchard, Chronicle of Higher Education, Julie Desjardins, the Madame Curie Complex. She was in New York. Thanks so much, you two, for joining us on the line in Points Beyond. Pleasure. Here in our Pleasure. studio, Sandy Graham, who's a woman at the University <laughs> of Waterloo, and Diane Freeman from Professional Engineers Ontario, seen there on the right, and Imogen Co. from York University on the left. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you.